If you don't hate change gears, there's a good chance you've probably never had to deal with them. Of course, they can be fairly useful, converting motion from a lathe spindle to its lead screw and feed shaft in very specific ratios for thread cutting and power feeding. But these occurrences are rare when compared to their primary function of turning even the simplest set of operations into an oily mess of mind-melting gear matrices, Sisyphean setup schemes, and plain old procrastination. Now, perhaps the easiest way to avoid this particular set of quandaries would be to simply never own or operate a metal lathe. But it's a little late for that. And the next easiest solution of making sure that the lathe you do own is equipped with a proper quick change gearbox is equally out of reach. So to save myself the hassle of changing change gears for every change in operation, I decided to set off down the path of building myself an electronic gearbox from scratch. Now, this project was, and still is, fairly heavy on the code. But don't worry, this isn't a tutorial, because I'm not a software engineer, and I still don't trust this thing to not suddenly decide that manslaughter seems like it could be fun, so you'll just be getting the juicy bits. Oh, and James, if you're watching, please don't take this personally. I just had to have a crack at it myself. Now, in order to understand exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve here, you first need to know a few basic facts about the wondrous machine that is the metal lathe. First of all, and this might be obvious, they cut metal. By turning these hand wheels, the operator is free to remove too much material in two axes. Damn it. Sometimes three if you haven't experienced how pleasurable the rigidity of a solid tool post mount can be. But that gets old real fast. And trying to cut threads freehand is sure to spoil your day. I think it's all of these. So most lathes also have a lead screw and a feed shaft for powered movement. The feed shaft's connected to the saddle gearbox, which can transmit rotation to the cross slide lead screw or the saddle pinion, depending on how you'd like to crash your machine that day. The lead screw, on the other hand, is engaged by the half nut. I know what you're thinking. Who would want half a nut? Well, the name's a little misleading because it's actually a whole nut, just in two halves. The lead screw has a high precision thread, in my case, with a 2.5 millimeter pitch, which means we should be able to use it in combination with the half nut and a thread cutting tool to cut some slightly less precision, but still fairly precise threads. So, if we want to cut a thread with an extraordinarily convenient pitch of 2.5 millimeters, we just have to have the lead screw rotate once for every rotation of the spindle. Hopefully it's obvious that we could also cut a 1.25mm thread with a ratio of 2 to 1, or a 5mm thread with a ratio of 1 to 2. And on my lathe, with its 3-speed gearbox, I can quickly switch between these pitches. I'm well aware that that might make it sound like everything's fine and dandy in this current configuration, but there's one crucial detail. With its 3-speed gearbox, that means there's no overlap between threading and feed pitches. Put simply, Anytime I want to switch from turning and facing to threading, or vice versa, I get to spend a couple of minutes reordering the change gears. That might not sound like much, but if you consider that 50% of the parts I turn want threads, and 100% of the parts I thread need turning, I'm wasting about 150% of my life on the process. So the plan was simple. F*** these gears off and attack the problem from three sides. Should make for a nice little side project in one of my next videos. First of all, we need to know our spindle's location. Yep, still there. Once we're sure it's right where we left it, we'll want to be able to keep track of its rotation. And for that, I'll employ an optical rotary encoder. And we'll of course need a motor, because we won't be using power from the spindle to drive the lead screw anymore. And finally, we'll need some sort of brain to take the pulses from the spindle encoder, run them through some equations, and spit out the required step pulses to the motor based on our desired feed pitches. Now, there were a lot of challenges to overcome for that last part. Like, how can I explain this without ruining audience retention? The first of many ants in my pants was quickly and reliably keeping track of the encoder pulses in real time. You see, this particular encoder outputs a signal over 1,999 times per revolution, which, 
If our spindle is rotating at 2500 RPM, it means almost 1.5 million pulses by the time I get to the punchline. I reached the solution after a week or so of research and trial and error. By copy-pasting this encoder validation logic from a random PDF I found somewhere on the internet. By popping that encoder validation logic into an interrupt, triggered every time one of the encoder pins changes state, our goal of quickly and reliably tracking spindle rotation should be complete. At this stage, I was just starting to realise the breadth of this undertaking was going to be a whole lot more than just a side project. What was supposed to have been a quick fix to a, let's face it here, pretty mundane problem had already turned into at least four, if not ten, all-nighters, and all my other projects had hit the back burner. The next challenge was converting that encoder input, or pulse count as the kids are calling it, into step pulses for the motor. This is easy peasy when your ratio is something nice, like two to one, where you can just send two step pulses for every encoder pulse you receive. But when you need some rare and exotic ratio, like two motor steps for every five spindle pulses, you have to do some pretty clever maths to keep things moving correctly. In my search for code to copy, I mean, uh, while I was working on this problem, I came across a solution known as Bresenham's line algorithm, which is commonly used to approximate straight lines in a digital space. Now, I still don't actually know what this is all about, so you'll just have to trust me when I tell you that this extremely handy bit of algebra, there's something I never thought I'd say, is the key to understanding our ratio rounding issues. And somehow I managed to distill the concept into a little bit of logic that can determine how many steps we need to send to the motor for any given pulse and feed ratio, without having to deal with any pesky floating points. Because, for some reason, apparently, those are bad. The ratios for all the threading and feed pitches are stored in a couple of arrays, and with a couple of buttons and a handful of luck, I should be able to cycle through them at will. And this cute little display will let me know what pitch and gearbox ratio I've selected. So with all that out of the way, I had some code that should be able to convert the encoder pulses from the spindle to motor steps for the lead screw flawlessly and in real time. But once I started testing, and no, you don't get any points for seeing this coming, that was pretty obviously not the case. No matter how many serial dot prints I included in my code, I just couldn't get the motor to stay synchronized with the encoder. I know some of you are probably burning with the knowledge of the painfully obvious source of these problems, but probably more of you haven't had any idea what I've been talking about for the past four and a half minutes. So I'll cut to the chase and then we can finally go and make some chips. Put simply, the Nano I'd been using for testing up until this point, with a clock speed of 16 megahertz, just wasn't fast enough to keep up with all the pulsating going on. But as soon as I got my hands on a 600 megahertz Teensy 4.1, my synchronization snag was promptly sullied, and the project stood poised for progression once more. So now that I had something that looked like it worked, it was time to give it complete control of a 300 kilogram spinning death machine to make sure that it actually worked. To drive the lead screw in the feed shaft, I decided to go with a closed loop NEMA 24 stepper motor, not least of all, because it fits real nice in this here gap. Closed loop motors have an encoder of their own, which is really handy in situations where you want the motor to do exactly what you tell it to, because it means the driver knows where the motor isn't, and if it isn't where it isn't, it'll try to get it there with some gentle encouragement. And if it's still where it is, it'll throw an alarm and give you a scolding look that says, you should have picked a bigger motor. Now as much as I intend to never have to use change gears again, I've got no illusions about the potential reliability issues of automation systems I hacked together here in the back shed, so I figured it'd be best to mount my modifications in such a way they'd be easy to undo. I took some cues from the original change gear arrangement for this and decided to attach both the encoder and motor to a plate that can then clamp down on this boss. By this stage, I'd spent far too long staring at my computer screen so I turned to the second most overplayed joke on Machinist YouTube. It was time for some CAD. With a rough idea of the overall size and shape of my mounting plate, I turned to the bandsaw to lop off the bulk of the waste, then used a slitting saw to reach into the corners. <laughs> it 
Then I could pretty up the edges on the rotary table. And add all the necessary holes and threads. Once the motor was mounted, I realized that the last thing in the world I wanted to do was machine an encoder mount with a built-in belt tensioner, and I was going to need some pretty niche timing pulleys to get everything running, not to mention a control panel and some buttons. So it was back to the computer anyway to model everything up for 3D printing. If you haven't realized by now, this project was very big on the whole make it up as I go along front, and without the ability to quickly iterate on these quite complex parts. I'd forever be cutting threads with mechanical gears like a plebeian, rather than with magnets and electrons, like some sort of future man. So I figured to speed up my prototyping production, it'd just make sense to pick up an A1 Mini and an AMS. I mean, you wouldn't expect these delicate hands to change spools manually now, would you? If you've got delicate hands, make sure you check out the affiliate link in the description below. Two printers made quick work of spitting out failed attempts until I had myself a set of perfectly usable pulleys and rotary encoder mounting components, along with a slick black control panel and a matching set of keycaps. The first point of order was to fit the large split pulley to the back of the spindle, and then I could mount the encoder and its tensioner arm. From the spindle to this idler pulley is a 1 to 2 ratio, and from the idler to the encoder, it's a 2 to 1 reduction, meaning the spindle and encoder should be rotating 1 to 1. This reduction situation might look a little redundant, but it's really the only option when you couldn't be bothered to wait for a belt large enough to wrap around two 120 tooth pulleys to arrive in the mail. Oh, and hopefully at high speeds, these smaller pulleys will be less likely to explode. Now before this next bit, I just want to say that I'm completely aware that using a 6mm unbranded GT2 belt in this application is asking for trouble, but I reiterate. It's really the only option when you couldn't be bothered to wait for a belt to arrive in the mail. So it'll just have to do for now. Up until this point, I'd still been using a solderless breadboard. I really wasn't sure exactly how I was going to mount the Teensy and all of the required connectors. And then it hit me. If solderless breadboards are a thing, then surely solderable ones are too, right? Yeah. That's right, I somehow only just found out about these things, and frankly I'm quite disappointed because no one brought them to my attention. With our main control board looking slightly less prototypey, it was time to cram it into the lathe's electronics enclosure, along with a 5 volt and a 48 volt power supply, and the motor driver. I added the keypad, screen, and main switch to the control panel, then carefully jammed the mess of cables I'd created inside. All the while crossing my fingers, I hadn't crossed any wires, and turned the entire lathe into a general purpose outlet. And with that, I had myself a perfectly operable electronic gearbox. More or less. At this stage, if we just ignore the control panel for a second, everything was working exactly as it was before. The motion of the lead screw or feed shaft is linked to the motion of the spindle via this gearbox. Power feed is still engaged with this lever. And I can still cut a thread, just like everyone else. using the half nut and thread dial indicator. The only difference is I'll never have to switch out the change gears again. Seems kind of silly to go to all that trouble and still have to manually engage the half nut though, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be too hard to keep track of the spindle's location in relation to the lead screw and then only start moving the tool again when everything's lined up. Oh, you could also set an endpoint, like up against the shoulder or something, so it knows where to stop threading. That'd be pretty convenient. Oh, and um, what if you do like a weirdly out of place Kill Bill chapter theme for the whole video? And then that'd give you the perfect excuse to cut it into two halves. My God. Once we're sure, it's right where we left it. 
will want to be able to keep track of its rotation. And for that, I'll employ an... And for that, I'll... In and for that, we'll employ a... And for that, I'll employ a... Ugh. And for that, I'll employ an optical rotor rotary and God. And for that, I'll and for that, I'll employ an optical rotary encoder. Nailed it.